the aim of this video is to really dive in deep into America's history since maybe like the end of World War II to the present day and really assess how great an empire it's been. Let's be honest, how well has America operated as a global empire, as a global hegemon, which is what it's been since the 90s, okay? We may be starting to come towards the end of that. Some people might argue that 2016 was a real turning point. Maybe 2008, you could argue, was a real turning point. The title itself will be a bit controversial. I know that there are going to be people in the comments being like, America isn't an empire. And look, I, I think you can make the case that it isn't, but I, I'm willing to make the case that it is. <laughs> We define empires, you know, a group of countries that are dominated uh, by a single mother country or a single overarching country, then I think you could definitely make the case that America is an empire in the sense, you know, militarily it has bases all over the world. It has over 800 bases all over the world. Economically, I don't think there's ever been a power like America. Maybe Britain in its heyday and maybe some ancient history scholars could prove me wrong or maybe they, they'd make the case for Rome or something. Economically, I don't know a single power like America. Not in terms of how it dominates global finance, the World Trade Organization, the World Bank, the IMF. A lot of people say these aren't American institutions, they're, they're global institutions, but you gotta say who sits on top of the globe, right? <laughs> you know, it's when, and when you take that into consideration, it becomes quite straightforward that they are kind of American institutions. The aim of this video is to really dive in deep into America's history since maybe like the end of World War II to the present day and really assess how great an empire it's been. I know that that's going to be a bit of a controversial statement. I get that empires have their dark patches um, and dark spots for sure. I think Britain did it, America's done it as well. There have been, these countries have definitely made mistakes and I'll be sure to mention that. I mean, that's what I'm going to take into consideration. When I'm, when I'm trying, when I'm assessing how great an empire has been, Yes, I'm going to try and look at all the good they've done, but I'm also going to try and balance it with all the bad they've done. And that will give me my final assessment, you know. The sign of a great power, a great country, a great empire is not just how strong it is or how economically successful it is. It's also how decent it is, right? How, you know, yes, I think it's inevitable that countries will serve themselves and pursue their own interests. But can countries pursue their own interests and and give something back in the process, okay? Can they engage in positive sum gains? And I'm going to take that a lot into consideration in my, in my assessment of America and how great an empire has been. Before we dive into it, do make sure you hit the like button and subscribe. World Order is a geopolitical channel, but I also cover things like media and industry. I do shows like the one I'm doing right now, and I also do more highly produced content like my mini movies and mini documentaries. Uh, they're really, really great. Go If you haven't already, do check them out and hit the bell icon so that you never miss out on a single video. Without further ado, let's dive into it. So before getting into the video, I just want to clarify that I think it's inevitable that countries will want to grow, expand and become powerful. I just think that's inevitable. There was a study that basically confirmed that some form of formation of identity in your lifetime is inevitable. People will inevitably form identities and as soon as you form an identity, that means there's something you're not and there has to be at any point in history at least two or more identities in the world. Now, if you take that idea and you synthesize it with this other idea, which is, well, you know, this is an idea I got from Jordan Peterson, right? That hierarchies are also inevitable. If you take both of these facts into consideration, you put them together, well, that basically confirms John Mearsheimer's thesis of the inevitability of um, great power politics and the tragic aspect of it that, you know, we're always going to get at least two powers kind of wrestling in the world in some capacity. Now, I think it's up to content creators like myself and writers and journalists and so on to put pressure on these great powers to get the word out and do what we can to avoid things getting too outrageous. You know, I, I think we should never accept a nuclear warfare as a norm. I think that would be a horrific state to live in. But I think it, I'm not one of these super left utopians who thinks we, we, we can somehow achieve a world of eternal peace and that we can erase all conflict. I don't even think that would be good for human beings. I think human beings need to channel a little bit of competitive energy in some form or another. Do I believe it's that should energy should be channeled into mass destruction and war? No. But do I think you have to reserve that stone in your left hand if things get out of control? Yes, I think you need to be willing to do what is necessary. Given that countries will strive for power and will want to become powerful, my next question is, right, well, if I absolutely have to pick a side, then who do I pick? Well, it might as well be the country I'm born in, right, which is the UK. Uh, and I'm not talking about supporting an overtly 
that host, uh, overtly nationalistic and ethno-nationalistic way at all. Definitely not. I think that's vulgar. But can I champion the United Kingdom? Consulting them in a way that steers them towards growth and prosperity, that would be something worth dedicating myself to. Now, given that I am now supporting the UK, I, br I zoom out and I think, okay, well, who, who does the UK really work for? It's America, okay? America runs the Western world. And that's linked me back to this video. Okay, well, how great an empire is America? Okay, how well have they operated? Let's be honest, how well has America operated as a global empire, as a global hegemon, which is what it's been since the 90s, okay? We may be starting to come towards the end of that. Some people might argue that that 2016 was a real turning point. And maybe 2008, you could argue, was a real turning point. But there are more and more people starting to argue that we are entering into a new age of either bipolarity or multipolarity. I don't think the bipolarity argument holds much sway, because think about it, if, if we were entering an era of bipolarity, it would be America versus China, which is the new great power struggle. But a couple of problems with that. America and China are all very, very interconnected markets. There's still a lot of cooperation there. And also, um, China isn't a regional hegemon. You know, it's, it's contained, it's surrounded by Russia, Japan, India, a lot of countries, Southeast Asian countries who are all kind of trying to contain it. And I don't feel like it's, it's powerful enough to be on America's level, maybe not yet, maybe in the future it will, who knows, but even then America, so long as America um, stays on top of things, I think it can pursue a pretty effective containment strategy against China. But anyway, look, let's go back, let's get back into the video. So by supporting Britain in a tolerant, respectful and liberal way, I am supporting America in a tolerant, respectful and liberal way, not in an excessively nationalistic way. Okay, so then my responsibility becomes right. Well, how do I help America? Given that America is inevitably gonna go off and try and dominate the world through imperialistic like practices. Well, can I do my best to put pressure on it to do all of that in a civilized way because I feel like you can you know you can be powerful and you can also be civilized and decent okay and the question now is has America been as decent as possible and I think between the end of World War II and the present day there have been times when it has been decent and it has whilst acting in its own self-interest also benefited the globe but then there have also been shockers and I mean super shockers and I'm going to go into all of that so yeah let's dive into part two so let's start with the end of World War II. I think America, right off the bat, did a really, really great thing by helping the Allies defeat Hitler. And then also, yeah, America, after World War II, it creates the United Nations, it creates NATO, it creates World Trade Organization, it creates IMF, World Bank, so on. I get that America used these tools to enhance its own power. I'm aware of that. And maybe one day I can make a video which is more critical of all of that, okay? But again, I'm going back to my assumption that great power politics, countries growing to become empires, it's a kind of like an inevitable tide within history. So did America use those institutions to also help others grow? Britain, did it actively pursue a policy that aimed to supplant Britain as it's totally supplanted the, the pound sterling as the world's currency and introduced the dollar? And there's so much I could say about that. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna make a whole video on America's economic strategy and how it displaced, actively sought to displace Britain. Uh, to become global hegemon, but that's a t t topic for another video. I think America's conduct at the end of uh, World War II gets an A plus for me, or maybe like an, a nine out of 10. I don't think there's much more it could have done better. You could argue it could have gotten involved in World War II earlier, but then that would have maybe hurt its profits. America's whole strategy was, let's just wait. Let's let the Russians take the brunt of it. Let's just sell lots of money, make lots of money by selling all our goods and services. And then let's get involved when everyone's worn out. We can get in, we can get involved, we can win the war, we can be the heroes. And yeah, it's, it's all good. And, you know, from a humanitarian perspective, that wasn't the best thing. But from a great, great power politics standpoint, from playing the game smart, that's a great, like they played it really well, like really, really well. So hats off, like an A plus for that. We'll quickly touch on the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki as well. This is a super controversial one because obviously lots and lots of people died. And again, I'm always, wherever I can, I argue against that. But if we're trying to now assess what it did for American power and what it did in the minds of everyone else in the world, you know, how it cemented America's reputation as global superpower. I think the dropping of those bombs did like a job like nothing ever could. 
And again, I've already said how I'm against nuclear weapons. I wouldn't wish that on anyone. And I, I, I again, I do not want to live in a world where we normalize that. But if you see it from a great power politics standpoint, I think the move did benefit America in some ways, as tragic and horrific as it was. Again, if you disagree, I happily welcome it, okay? So moving on, we're, just before we get into the Cold War, I think we've got to look at things like the, the just the little bit just before the Cold War, like when the, the tensions are starting to, to develop between the Soviets and the Americans. And, you know, I think a lot of this, you know, you got the um, you got the Marshall Plan, another, another A+, plus just for helping you. Again, yeah, it's a bit humiliating for countries like Britain, who used to be the big dog, like being supplanted by America, yes. But Marshall Plan basically helps, prevents Europe from succumbing to communism. So again, another A-plus scheme for me. As, as, a, as a centrist, as someone with liberal sympathies, as someone with capitalist sympathies, I think that's an A-plus scheme. We then move on to the Korean War, okay? Again, I th how would I rate the Korean War? I feel like the Korean War is like a B plus because America gets involved. It essentially saves South Korea. It essentially ensures that South Korea remains a free country. When I say free country, it ensures that South Korea remains open to American business and exports and so on. <laughs> like it, American neo-imperialism. But also, you know, the alternative for South Korea was becoming part of North Korea or just a, a communist career, right? And America saved them from that. And I think a lot of, I'd love to talk to South Koreans and get their opinions on this, but I think a lot of them would be grateful for that because I've heard some dodgy things about North Korea. I think I've heard some really bad things about North Korea. I, and again, I get that this is all a Western centric perspective. I'm aware of that. But I also, as I said in my previous video, I believe that there are some values which are fundamental and universal. I believe that all people ideally whilst holding on to their own cultures, would like some degree of liberty and tolerance and rule of law and democracy. I think these are fundamentally good things. So again, I think America did South Korea a favor there. Could I'm giving them a B plus just because they didn't win. But then the alternative, so you know, you've got to bear in mind, you know, the Chinese and the Soviets were backing the North Koreans. And if America had pushed any further, that could have resulted in nuclear war. This is a war going on in 1950 to 1953. By this point, the Soviets, a year in 1949, the Soviets developed their own nuclear weapon. And come the Korean War, if America pushed any further into North Korea, that could have prompted the uh, the first ever nuclear confrontation between the Americans and the Soviets. So I think Truman was actually played that quite intelligently. I I I, I never want to trigger nuclear weapons at all. I'm quite adamant about. It. I'm saying. If push comes to shove and someone's about to use them on us, then I think maybe be willing to use it. But otherwise, no, I don't think you should ever use it on an offensive. I don't, I, I, ideally not. And Truman didn't, so credit to him. I, it gets a B plus just because he didn't quite liberate uh, North Korea. Uh, liberate, I keep saying liberate. He didn't quite open North Korea up to US exports and <laughs> interests. So yeah, B plus. So moving on, with, I'm just gonna look at the 50s and 60s more generally now. During the 50s and 60s, you're really starting to, you, you're in the thick of the Cold War. America's coming off the back of World War II when it had 50% of the world's economy. America is so powerful. Can you imagine how powerful it would have been if the Soviets hadn't been a thing? It would have been the America of the 90s, but with twice the financial power, which is just insane. So come the 50s and 60s, America's fighting its Cold War with the Soviets, you know. Everywhere the Soviets go, the Americans go just that little bit harder. It's such a great period, man. I'm going to make some movies about it, so do stay tuned. If you're enjoying this video so far, do give it a like. If you're new here, subscribe. And hit that bell icon so that you see all my mini movies that are going to come up about the Truman and Eisenhower years, okay? I can't wait to make those. If you're talking about how great they played it, they played it really well because they pulled of some great coups during this time in Iran, Guatemala, later on Chile and stuff. But these are this is where ass assessing this empire becomes problematic for me because with Iran in 1953, with Guatemala in 1954, with Chile in the early 70s, and there are lots of others by the way, but these are some of the ones I know more about. Um, you're really starting to see America, yes, prioritize its self-interest and yes, help its business interests, but it's coming at the expense of the inhabitants of those other subordinate countries. It's coming at the expense of democracy for them. It's coming at the expense of their own self-determination. And this is where America starts becoming really kind of the bully that some people accuse it of today, I think. You know, with Iran, they appointed a demo they democratically appointed a leader and America still got rid of him just because his interests didn't align with American and British interests. Now, I get America has a global order to run, 
and it needs to persuade people to fall in line. I get that, but it's coming at the expense of basic humanitarian values, values that are stipulated in the UN Declaration of Rights, by the way. So it, it is hypocritical behavior. C, maybe even D for just breaking some fundamental values. And I get that no country can ever 100% pursue a foreign policy based on ideals and values. It's, it's impossible. A statesman who I've read a lot about, Henry Kissinger, once said, a statesman must balance their ideals with reality. Kissinger's a very controversial figure. Perhaps he went far too far into the real politic pragmatic sphere where he did some quite terrible things. But I think the quote is very valuable, and that's why I'm bringing it up. America's coups during the 50s and 60s and 70s and so on, even after that, during the Cold War II in the 80s, um, I think it's getting like a maybe overall a C. Yes, it pursued its national interest, but it, it caved on its on being the exceptional country for me a little bit. Look, there are so many things I can discuss. I could discuss the Cuban Missile Crisis, which I would give Kennedy an A for, by the way. I could discuss the America leaving the gold standard. I'm still, I said this in my last video, I'm still learning about economics. So you know, I'd love to come back and do a separate video on that when I know just a little bit more about that. Before moving on from the Cold War, I absolutely have to discuss Vietnam. Vietnam is really like the biggest blunder America has had so far. So America at the time believed in this thing called domino theory, which they thought, okay, so if one country becomes communist, every country becomes communist. But again, I don't think it just came down to that. I think America was very, very powerful. I think they were trying to spread as many liberal democracies as possible so they could open as many markets as possible contain their enemy, the Soviet Union, as much as possible, sell as many weapons by this time in the 1960s, the military-industrial complex, which Eisenhower warned about, is starting to pick up a lot of momentum, and I think America needs a lot of reasons to sell weapons, use weapons, and they're, they're not hesitant about being tr um, trigger-happy and going in for wars, even if it is in remote parts of the world like Vietnam. And it ends up being a massive blunder for them. I don't think many people were that skeptical about Vietnam at first, but within a few years, it becomes very obvious. I mean, this is what triggered the hippie movements of the late 60s, right? Vietnam is America's blunder. And, you know, I, I, I could make a separate video on that as well. For those who haven't already, do check out my video on Nixon and Kissinger and, the, the, how they, uh, and their intervention in Vietnam. How great was America during this time? Not great at all. I think the 70s is actually quite... If the 50s and 60s are generally quite an optimistic period for America, I think the 70s is a much darker period in the sense that <clears throat> you've got the aftermath of Vietnam, which by the way was a failed war. It's not like, it wasn't like Korea where they actually secured 50% of it. Vietnam is just a, an atrocious failure because they spend, you know, I don't like, in today's money, it would probably be like trillions they spent on Vietnam. They lost 50,000 soldiers, over 100,000 died in total when you put together Vietnamese and American lives. And they didn't even get anything. Vietnam caved within a couple of years of them leaving. It was just taken by the North. So Vietnam is like a failure in every way you look at it. How great is America during the Vietnam era? America gets like an F during this time. I think it's a massive blunder. And then they've got Watergate going on back at home. Really dark period. It's not until the release of Star Wars in 1977, which I'd argue America starts making a comeback. I think Reagan kind of cements that a little bit more as well for them. I think the the national myth around Reagan is he's seen as one of their greater presidents. Um, now, I could debate that for another video, but yeah. So let's move into part three, which is the unipolar moment onwards, okay? Yes, I could have talked about the 80s with Reagan, but I really just wouldn't want to move on. This video is going on for a while now. Let's look at the unipolar moment and how great an empire America has been since the unipolar moment. The unipolar moment is really America at its absolute strongest. America starts expanding NATO during this time. The 90s, I think generally in terms of America's position in the world, never been better. It's the undisputed global power. The Soviet Union has collapsed. Whenever it wants, it can call upon allies to come help it in different theaters of the globe. Francis Fukuyama writes his book, The End of History. Liberal democracy is proclaimed the victor. You know, I don't think things could be better than the early 90s. It's really with 9-11 that America starts flexing its might in ways that it's never done so before. And again, my analysis of this period is going to be close to my analysis of the 50s, 60s period, where you've got an America that's going into Iraq and Afghanistan for really bizarre reasons. I mean, does anyone know why America got involved in Iraq to this day? Like, they said it was about nuclear weapons. 
they didn't find any. And I get that, like, Saddam had to go, because, I mean, the Chris late, great Christopher Hitchens made the case, like, this guy was as bad as a Hitler or a Stalin. I get that he was bad, but, you know, America went into these countries, like Afghanistan and Iraq, and it just destroyed them, and it didn't leave them any better off. Afghanistan's gone back to the Taliban, you know, and Iraq, I, I, is that country much better than what it used to be? I, Okay, so we don't have Saddam, but is it much better? The 2000s is really an, an American exercise in military imperialism and how far, you know, again, this goes back to the military industrial complex and just how big an industry this is. I feel like they, they need to have wars just to use these weapons and make profits from these weapons. And again, it's not the only reason. You could talk about the oil issue as well. You could talk about the global pounds of power and trying to turn the Middle East into liberal democracies and getting them all to read the New York Times, which is a direct quote. You could talk all about that, but you know, it is a case of militarism gone extreme. Just in the same way that America's economic imperialism went to extremes during the 50s, 60s, even before, I could, and again, I will make a video on that. Have Americans got their global strategy right, not just in the Middle East, but in other parts of the world? We could look at like Ukraine and, you know, the war going on between Ukraine and Russia. There are some people who argue that that was started because Russia had concerns over NATO and expansion. And look, I was I was a big fan of NATO expansion for a lot of these countries. Any country that wanted it in an ideal world, you allow them to join NATO because that's what they want, right? Self-determination, democracy, all these things led these countries to want to join NATO. And that's a great thing. But when you take a more realistic uh, perspective on this issue, Ukraine is a country just outside Russia. And it, some people would argue that, you know, the Russians, America's strategy has provoked Russia into that war. Okay, I'm just, I'm just pushing forward the argument here. You know, you know, you have to understand that Russia looks at Ukraine the same way Britain would look at Wales or America would look at Mexico. Do you think America or Britain would tolerate Russia forming a military pact with Wales or, or Mexico? I don't think they'd... We, we know they wouldn't. I mean, we saw this with the Cuban Missile Crisis back in the 60s. America didn't tolerate Russia putting missiles in Cuba. So why would Russia tolerate America forming a, uh, bringing Ukraine into NATO, thus allowing America to set up a position vehicles and uh, units and, and weapons in Ukraine? I, I just don't understand that logic and that rationale. People arguing that Putin's another Hitler and that if he takes Ukraine, as he's going to come into Europe is just nonsense because, you know, he, the other countries in Europe are part of NATO. Putin wouldn't dare try it. If he did, he'd be in direct conflict with the United States and all its allies. And that's just a conflict. He he can't. Yeah, he could go down in flames. But I don't I don't sense that he's that crazy. So, look, I, I, that's just my position on the Ukraine issue. I th by the way, I just want to clarify, it's a tragedy what's going on. And my advice is coming from a from someone who wants to end that war. I just want to be really clear on that because, you know, nowadays you just get attacked for saying whatever. I want that war to come to an end. And I think I sympathize with the Mearsheimer argument that, well, maybe we should approach this from a realistic standpoint if we're serious about ending the war. I think Donald Trump has really brought an end to the unipolar moment. And it's not just him. I think structural, underlying structural problems have brought an end to the unipolar moment. You could say the 2008 financial crash accelerated the end of America's time as global hegemon. You could say it began with that. Trump is just a kind of a symptom of that to some extent and a symptom of the problem a lot of people are facing with globalization. I, for one, was a big fan of, and still to what to some extent a fan of globalization, but you can't, I mean, there's a lot of arguments saying that it's led to a lot of countries bankrupting their working classes, a lot of these jobs being created from these big companies, not necessarily going to people in their own countries, they're just giving them out to cheap labor in other countries, and I think that's had some problems, you've seen some populist backlashes in the form of Trump and Brexit and so on. How great an empire has America been? I think overall... <laughs> There's never been an empire quite as powerful as it. Who's more powerful at their peak, America or Britain? That would be a really great video to do. That would be a really great topic to do a video on. And maybe one day I will. I feel like I need to know a little bit more about the British Empire before I do something like that. But Britain could have been just as economically powerful. And it may have had just as much territory under its influence. Maybe even more. But I don't think... I think one thing Ameri the American Empire did better than any empire, better than the British, was... They really marketed themselves very well. You know, they go and take basic, basically take these countries, influence these countries with their military and, econ and economy. And they, they kind of market it as, 
you're now liberated. <laughs> like, come on, man. Like, who are you kidding? Man? <laughs> like, but that you know, they 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 pull that off. I mean, a lot of people back at the, in their country believe that, and a lot of I think a lot of people. I mean. The, the argument holds so much sway that there are scholars who argue for it. I mean, it's it's insane how they've cloaked neo-imperialism as liberation and, and freedom. <laughs> there goes back to that famous meme. Um, I remember when <laughs> there's a, a picture of an eagle just looking stone cold. And it's just uh, the, the, the top caption goes, I hear Mars has some oil. And then the bottom caption says, sounds like Mars could do with some freedom. <laughs> like, and that is America. Like, whatever they need, they'll go and take it and then just say, oh, yeah, but we're freeing you. It's like, yeah, you're freeing us to be taken, man. <laughs> like, anyway, I just find that funny, man. I find it really funny. Uh, again, I'm not, like, saying how dare they at all. I, I just think this is how the world works. I think this is how the world rolls. You know, you get your powerful countries and you get your less powerful countries. And... And that's not justifying some of the atrocious things the powerful countries do. As I said at the beginning of this video, I think it's up to people like us to, you know, shed light on these things and do what little we can to hold these countries to account. Um, you know, I think one thing I really respect about Christopher Hitchens is I think he really did try and do that to a large extent. But look, I mean, by the end of the day, the American empire has created a lot of opportunities, a lot of benefits for its own people, for a lot of the people of the world, okay? Um, yes, are, are its tech companies and military industrial complex and so on, are they a bit, could they, could they, <laughs> could their power be limited? Could you question what they're doing? Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, I still got an iPhone and <laughs> still got a lot of these services. So, yeah, I got some great American television. <laughs> Guys, look, if you've enjoyed this video, do give it a thumbs up. If you're new here, subscribe. World Order is a geopolitical channel that also covers media and industry. I do really live for my mini movies, which I'm just trying to get make better every time I release one, you know. So if you haven't already, do go check those out. If you like this video, then hit the like button. If you are new here, subscribe. And as always, do hit the bell icon so that you stay up to date with all new World Order content. Okay, thanks a lot, guys. Take care, and I'll see you all in the next one.